there are many kinds of systems and now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some different kinds of systems uh, that we encounter in the real world. Uh, of course, these are systems of the kind that we, the special kind that you're talking about right now. So uh, we have those systems which are operate in continuous time. And these are ones where x of t is a continuous function of time. And similarly, we have discrete time. And discrete time here, x of t and y of t, of course, are going to be uh, discrete functions of time. So they are described only for certain values of time steps. So at, at these time instants here and here and here, they take on a certain value. This might be what x looks like. And in between, we really don't know what happens to them. We don't really care. We are just going to look at the behavior of the system at these discrete time instants. Okay, and in continuous time, the function is defined for all values of the real line. Um, similarly, we have uh, analog systems where the y-axis is defined to be real. So we take we can take any value on the real axis over here. And in the di uh, digital system uh, is where the y-axis over here can only take uh, discrete values. So in the digital case, we only have a certain set of allowed values on the y-axis, whereas in the analog case, all values are allowed on the y-axis. Um, and of course, we can combine continuous and discrete analog and digital systems just as with uh, processes that we talked about earlier and signals that we talked about earlier. Uh, in addition, there are a few other special kinds of systems. One is called a causal system. And a causal system means that the system only acts on inputs from the past. So if you have that system over here as H and you're looking at the input over here, H can only access, so to speak, what happened in the past. Whereas in a A-causal system, uh, it can access the input both in the past and in the future. And so uh, you might think that's a fairly weird thing to do, but a causal system is easy if you have log files. You can you know what the future is going to be, so the system in some sense operates on log files. Um, and, uh, and, and so if you have traces, you can do that. Now, a causal systems are usually useful only as uh, showing lower bounds. That's that even if you know the future exactly, you really can't do better than uh, the A-causal system. Uh, and so this is usually used to prove lower bounds. It's not something that you can use in practice. Okay, so in addition to this, we can talk about, uh, we can categorize systems as memoryless or dynamic. So a memoryless system operates only on what it sees at that moment. So it, it, if, you, if you look at x of t, for example, so this is a t over here, and um, we have over here on the y-axis x of t. And we can think of this some continuous system over here. At some point in time, x of t has some value, and h actually operates on that value. At the next instant of time, such as this over here, h cannot remember what happened to x in the past. It simply has no memory at all. And in contrast, in a dynamic system, H can remember what happened in the past. And for example, H can uh, have a local store which keeps track of the past value of X and uses that in creating the next value. And so uh, dynamic systems, for example, would be a system with some kind of storage. It could be a digital storage or some kind of a buffer, uh, such as uh, a reservoir of water is a buffer, for example, which remembers how much water was uh, incident on the system in the past. Okay, and now for some more uh, interesting uh, in, uh, categorizations, there's something called a time invariant system. And a time invariant system uh, is a, sort of a fairly straightforward concept. It says that uh, the system's parameters don't change with time. So if the uh, system has output y of t uh, for input x of t, so y t is h of x of t, then if we change time, if you move time to the right, so we do y t minus t is equal to h of x of t minus t. So all we're saying is that if we time shift the input over here, so the x 
is time shifted by the value capital T then the value of y is also time shifted by capital T and that sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do because there's no reason why uh, doing the same action uh, at a different point in time ought to affect the output and if that is the case then we have a linear we have a time invariant system um, we also would like to consider what are called linear systems and that's a very important concept as well so a linear system is precisely defined as something which satisfies two properties one is called additivity additivity and Conceptually, what we're saying is this. Let's say that some input x1 leads to some output y1, and some input x2 leads to some output y2. What would happen if we were to give the input x1 plus x2 to the system? And if the system gives a value y1 plus y2, then we say that it's additive. And if not, it's not additive. So that's pretty straightforward. And mathematically, we can say that if uh, if y1 equals h of x1, y2 equals h of x2, then for an additive system, y1 plus y2 equals h of x1 plus x2. And if it's if this if this is not satisfied, then it is not additive. The other property we need to satisfy in addition to additivity is called homogeneity or scaling. And what this means is that if we have a system such as this and we give it some input x and it has some input y coming out of it, what would happen if we were to give it the input k times x? In other words, we're just scaling up the input by value. And if the output is in fact k of y, when you scale that's k of x, then we would say that it satisfies the scaling property. So again, if you write it this way, we can say if y equals h of x, then ky equals h of kx. Now we can combine the two of additivity and homogeneity and we get what's called the condition of superposition. And superposition essentially says that if, uh, for, if, uh, if y1 is h of x1, y2 is h of x2, uh, and for scalars k1 and k2, you have two other scalars k1 and k2, uh, then k1 y1 plus k2 y2 equals h of k1 x1 plus k2 x2. And so this property of superposition is in fact required for a linear system. So just as a simple example, let's consider the transfer function hx equals x squared. And we want to know, is this uh, linear or not? Well, we can see that uh, h, of, uh, h, of k1, y, h of k1 x1 plus k2 x2 is going to be nothing more than k1 x1 plus k2 x2 squared by definition. But of course, the sum of the inputs would be k1 squared x1 squared plus k2 squared x2 squared. If we do, if you were to take it piece by piece, and these two don't match, so obviously these two are not the same, and so this system is not linear. In fact, it's a quadratic. Um, it's worth looking and understanding that this particular uh, the scaling, which sounds kind of straightforward over here actually is hiding something, which is that uh, we can't always scale indefinitely. So in any system, when you have some input over here, if let's say this is the input, I'm not looking at time anymore, I'm looking at input, and this is the output. Uh, what we're really saying over here is that we have some kind of linearity like this. As the input goes up, the output goes up. In fact, uh, we are going to have uh, a zero offset, not just over here, it goes up like this. 
Um, but in in practice, when at some point outputs always saturate. We can for any real physical system, we can never maintain this path indefinitely. And so at this point, the system becomes nonlinear because of saturation. So in practice, we are never actually going to get a scaling system to scale indefinitely. So in fact, uh, we can't actually have a uh, perfectly linear system ever. So linear systems are an approximation of the real thing, but they're good enough an approximation that we can use them for uh, many practical systems.